All right, so now if I just have the bar magnet here, just holding it steady, what's the current in the coil? Current is zero. The current is zero. If the bar magnet's not moving, then the magnetic field is constant and there's no change. Okay? So if there's no change in the magnetic field, we don't measure a current in the coil. We don't measure any potential difference or, or electric field across the ends of this coil. So what I have to do instead is I have to change the magnetic field. And I'm going to change it by moving the bar magnet very far away. So I'm going to say the bar magnet is going to move that way. And so this is the initial position. Final position is way down here. And I move it very far away. So if I move it very far away, what's the final magnetic field in the coil? Zero. Okay, so let's say B final is zero. And therefore... The final flux is going to be zero. And let's say I do this in a short amount of time. Let's say it takes me, uh, I don't know, let's say 0.3 seconds. So three tenths of a second to move it from this position to very far away where the magnetic field in here is now zero. Let's see if we can find the EMF. In other words, if I had a voltmeter hooked up or a galvanometer hooked up, to this coil, I want to find the EMF that's induced in the coil. Well, first of all, let's get the direction. Let's get the direction. B initial is that way. B final is zero. So what's delta B? What's the direction of delta B? Is it in or out? It's out. Okay, so delta B is out. Negative dB dt is therefore in. And so we know that the current is going, and therefore the, or I should say the magnet, the electric field, and therefore the conventional current, the curly electric field, if negative dB dt is in, then we're going to get a curly electric field in this orientation, pointing that way at the top, down on this side, that way over here, and that way here. So once I have the direction, all I need to worry about is the magnitude. I've got the direction of this electric field, so I'm just going to think about the magnitude of the EMF. And that is going to be the magnitude of d flux dt. Well, let me make an approximation here. The a derivative is nothing more than the limit as you go to a very small change of the change in the numerator over the change in the denominator. So this is, we can also sort of write this as an approximation of delta flux over delta t, provided that that delta t is small, okay? It's like taking the average uh, flux, change in flux over change in time versus the instantaneous change in flux per unit time. So you can make an analogy to saying uh, velocity, writing it as a average velocity. We're talking about the x component, delta x over delta t versus the instantaneous velocity, dx dt. Same sort of thing going on here. So we're approximating the average to being the instantaneous. Well, this is then going to be the final flux minus the initial flux over the change in time. Final flux was 0. Initial flux was 0 .00, 0 .00565. And delta T is 0.3 seconds. So we're just going to get 0 0.00565 divided by 0.3, which gives us what? 0, 0.0188. Okay, and then this is the absolute value, so we're not going to worry about the negative sign. We already got the direction. Point, what was it? 0 0.0188, and the unit should be volts. Now, there's a bit of an issue because... 
we found the flux through essentially one loop, right? But how many loops do we have? So what do we have to do to find the total EMF in the coil? Multiply by 500. So just be careful of this. This is the EMF of one loop, okay? And so we found the EMF of one loop is that uh, 0.0188 volts. So the total EMF of the coil, 500 times 0 0.0188, and that gives you what? Was it 9.4? 9 9 9.4 volts, okay? Which is why you need, uh, and typically why we needed lots and lots of turns to actually see an effect, okay? The coil we had the other day was something like 3,000 turns of wire, and we were able to see sizable voltages, okay? Uh, something that would actually show up on a galvanometer. So point you're, here you're getting something on the order of uh, millivolts, okay, or uh, hundreds of a volt, and you're multiplying that by 500 turns, they all add up, and you get a sizable voltage that you can measure, okay? Uh, okay. Just why, is it, why do we need to multiply by 500? Another way you can think about this is you're applying, you're doing this integral, essentially. You're adding up the electric field over the whole distance. You found by going through one loop, essentially the electric field in one loop, if you multiply that by the distance of one loop, you just get the EMF in one coil. So you have to multiply it essentially by the total distance in 500 turns, which is going to be 500 times one loop, which gives you 9.4 volts. Okay, so that's, that's essentially where that's coming from. Questions on any of this? Yes, Luke. Because we're finding the flux. Okay, so we're finding the flux through the uh, the interior of the path bounded by the coil. Okay, and so we're talking about the magnetic flux uh, through that area. So the magnetic flux is field times area. Okay. Now let let's let's go to the next step here, which is what if you wanted to find the electric field in that, inside that wire? We just found the EMF. And so now we want to think about what is the non-Coulomb electric field. Well, then let me, again, let me just look at this one turn. And we said the EMF was uh, 0, 0.00. 565 volts. Okay. No, sorry, that was the uh, that was the flux. The voltage was 0 .0 0.0188, 188 volts. Okay. Well, now I can use exactly what you're talking about. This idea of going around the path to figure out the electric field because it was the the change in the flux, the magnetic flux in the interior that gives us this EMF, but that's related to the path integral of the electric field. So it's the flux of the magnetic field or the change in the flux in the magnetic field, the path integral is associated with the electric field. Okay, So let's look at that. We have an EMF which is this integral around a closed loop of the non-Coulomb electric field dotted with delta L, okay? Well, by symmetry, I would expect that the electric field should be changing in direction, obviously, but the same magnitude everywhere around this loop, right? And so we've, we've dealt with situations like this before. If I'm going around the path, I'm thinking about breaking this up into delta L vectors, and each little segment of that path has a delta L vector that is parallel to the electric field at that location, right? So there is an ENC and delta L is upward. But here the electric field is pointing that way, but the delta L is that way, right? So each one of those dot products is going to give me a positive contribution. I'm 
So I could write, so I could write this as the magnitude of ENC times delta L times the cosine of zero because they're in the same direction. And then I can say that, well, if I assume that it's a symmetric situation, the electric field is the same, magnitude of electric field is the same everywhere. It just boils down to this, where the magnitude of the field times the path integral of delta L over a closed loop gives us the EMF. What's this going to be? What's that path integral of delta L over, over closed loop going to be? That that's say that was not zero. That's the zero would be we did path, when we did path integrals of the electric field for static charges over a closed loop that gives us zero. Okay, but in this case we're not getting zero. We've we've taken the electric field out of the integral and we're just looking at summing up the path, right? So that's the circumference. That's the circumference, right? That's and someone said that is two pi r, two pi r. So you've got 2 pi r times the electric field being equal to 0 0.0188. Sorry. You can solve for the electric field. The magnitude of it is going to be 0 0.0188 volts divided by 2 times pi times, we said the radius was what, 3 centimeters, 0.03 meters. So what's the electric field? What's the electric field in the coil? Point, what is it, 0 0.099? So about one, 1 volt per meter? Point, point 0 0.099. Oh, sorry. I'm hearing one thing and writing another. 0 0.099 volts per meter. Okay. Questions here? We see how this this relates. So it's it's again it's the magnetic flux and it's not even the flux it's the change in flux that's important for getting the EMF, but that EMF is related to a path integral of the electric field. That's how an EMF is defined. Okay. Okay. Let's. Do the quiz. Let's stop here and do the quiz, and we'll pick up with uh, more on Faraday's law next time. And so now the quiz. We're back to we're back to Gauss's law. We're back to Gauss's law. And remember, Gauss's law said that the total electric flux over a closed surface. is equal to the charge inside over epsilon zero. Here's several diagrams of a, a box, and all, the boxes are all the same size. You have two magnitudes of electric field, E2 and E1, and E1 is half of E2. And uh, you have E1, uh, well, you have electric field on the left and right surfaces of this box, and you can just assume it to be zero everywhere else, uh, just to make it simple. In which diagram is the charge inside the box the largest positive value? Largest positive value. And we got answer number four. That's correct. Very good. Very good. 